Good morning. Good morning. I want to share just a few announcements. Many of you have seen in the paper that Ed Erb has passed on to the Lord. His service will be tomorrow at Ephrata Church of the Brethren. The viewing from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., service following, and luncheon after graveside back at the Ephrata Church of the Brethren. Please pray for peace and comfort for the entire family. It is truly a praise knowing it is with his Lord and Savior, plus other loved ones who had preceded him. Immediately following the message and the closing of the service today, we're having a very brief board meeting up front. The rest of you will exit and hopefully go downstairs for cookie time. But uh, So we will uh, have our meeting here immediately after, then come down and join you. I hope all of you are noticing the bulletin board. Now that's kind of uh, by the coat rack, by the mentoring, but uh, our secretary works very hard at that. And there are a bunch of events coming up, uh, including of the Lions Club Fish and Shrimp Fry that they're offering uh, to support some of their ministers. Also, this will be in next week's bulletin. Our church has decided to work with Blessings of Hope to support those who are struggling in the Ukraine, particularly children and refugees. We will have that in the bulletin next week and set a time perhaps we can take a special offering or designate envelopes above and beyond our weekly giving to that cause. Any other announcements this morning? Yes, Cindy. I believe that it is Jim Ross's birthday today. Oh, Jim Ross.
me in your worship his majesty hymnal to responsive reading 279. We will read this responsibly with the congregation reading everything printed in red, and I ask you to read with feeling and volume. And we're sharing this on behalf of a troubled world where now whether well over three million refugees are making their way in Europe, having left their homes, and a world in great pain and struggle. And we'll begin, I'll read what's printed in black. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope and as it is but hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one also hope for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. And in the same way, the Spirit also helps us in this. For we do not know how to pray that we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with the ones to be for us. And He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God calls all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purposes. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, And let us pray. Dear God, we have just affirmed our hope in you. And your promise that you work all things together for good in the long view. Our world and many of our lives are hurting and troubled. And at times our hearts seem to break. So we gather in your house and in your name and look to you as children to a heavenly Father for hope, for strength, and for your power working in our lives. We give ourselves anew to you this hour and everything that is said and done and ask that it may be pleasing and also fill our hearts with the strength we need for the days ahead. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And we're going to turn to our hymn of praise. Hallelujah, what a Savior. You may rise.
that is one of my all-time favorites of the church. At this time, we can have our puppet ministry. <coughs> I'm so glad that's over. What's over, Harry? All of my distant relatives finally left. They were all staying at my house visiting my sister, so she just had a baby and all. What's so bad about having a couple relatives over? It wouldn't be so bad if there was only a couple, but I've got, let's see, there's Grandma Mildred, Uncle Willie, Cousin Linda, Grandpa Gibby, and Aunt Charlotte. Five, six, seven, I think there's about nine adults and 16 children. Wow, you sure have a big family. Where did all of you sleep? Well, eight of us slept in my room and the other eight slept on tents outside. I'll bet you didn't sleep well. I'm surprised I got any sleep at all. My cousin Linda was blaring some rapper out of her iPod until 2 a.m. in the morning. And Susie was crying because all she wanted was a cup of water. And then little Brian started crying because he was afraid of the dark. And then... I get the point. I've got a headache just thinking about it. I think you could have used some peas. Ew, I hate peas. They're nasty. Not peas, silly. Peace. It means to be happy and content instead of fighting and commotion. That's what I need. The Bible says, in peace I will lie down and sleep for you alone, or lo Lord will keep me safe. Thanks, Lucy. Maybe I'll finally... Harry! <laughs> Get some sleep! We come to our time of sharing our joys and concerns. Of course, we lift up the trauma in Central Europe and the war in Ukraine, praying for God's healing will and peace there. Any other? Chris? Yes. Remember Clarence's daughter, Pam? She became ill and is getting better and is grateful and asking for prayers from the church. That's Pam. I hear no others. We're going to turn to our prayer song, 294. Which I'll read. 294. Um.
And dear God, we have just asked you to do something, and we mean it in our hearts, starting with me. Please touch me and each of us anew. There is stress in this world, in our families, in everywhere we turn. We need you and your filling, and as our girls shared, your peace and perspective to face whatever comes at us. Help us to move forward and deeper in our faith. God, touch our hearts, open and soften and remake them in your will. We pray for Pam this morning. You have seen her through many challenging experiences. She is on the mend and healing. And we pray that you would touch her this morning and lead her from grace to grace. We pray for this horrible war and, in a sense, standoff in, in, with Ukraine, Russia, and the rest of the world. All we can do is pray for your healing power and your working of peace in this horrible situation. We lift our own circumstances to you. And each of us now takes a quiet moment to lift one person, one situation to you, and pray and plead for your help right now. Dear God, may these persons we have prayed for sense your working, your leading, and your nudge in their lives to move forward in healing and reconciliation and a new beginning as each is needed. Thank you for the gift of prayer, for, hear, for hearing us, and for your love, which is outpoured afresh each day in our lives. All of these things we pray now in your name. Amen. Amen. And we're going to sing hymn number 266, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. I'm sorry, 266.
top of your bulletin, there are three very curious verses in the New Testament. And this is the first time in my life that formally, in regular worship, I have ever gotten to teach on this subject. I did a brief meditation on it when we were sitting outside in the fields on June 20th, 2020. I remember the date because we were sitting on the hill and Brett Swales brought in what I call a little stick chair. He put it down, sat in it, and fell over backwards and rolled down the hill. And he was fine. Pastors remember that stuff. You can't flop in a chair that's leaning backward. And by the way, Brett is preaching at this church of the brethren. Uh, they have a, a pastor of pastoral care there, but uh, they want support uh, for regular preaching because that is not the current pastor's uh, calling. So, so this is a treat for me. And my guess is that none of you have ever heard a sermon on this topic, which is included in the Apostles' Creed. We're not a freedom church. But we're basically talking about what happened to Jesus between his death on the cross and his resurrection uh, Easter morning. And this message flows out of the two Bible study on Tuesday, the past two weeks, because it's on 1 Peter, and we came across two of these very rare references in the Bible. I'm going to read our text, which is printed at the top of your bulletin. Jesus went and preached to the spirits in prison. The gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. When Jesus ascended on high, he led captives in his train. We find Jesus after his death on the cross here, but before his resurrection Sunday morning. We find him somehow already coming back to life and ministering salvation to those who had died up to that point in history. In Christian thinking, there has been considerable thought and energy spent on what happened in those hours, on what Jesus did between his crucifixion and his resurrection. There's minor differences of opinion, and this topic is, is almost never given any attention in our tradition. Have any of you ever heard a sermon on this topic? What happened? Cindy has. And Cindy has. <laughs> There's a technical term called the harrowing of hell. I call it when heaven conquers hell. In farming today, of course, there is a term for breaking up a hard and weedy field such as this time of year. The term is to harrow a field. This implement typically has spike teeth and very hardened metal discs at an angle that are drawn over the field to root up the weeds, break up clods of dirt, and then to kind of re-level the soil. In daily life, we still use the word harrowing to describe a very disturbing <coughs> and stressful experience. I can truly tell you that one airplane landing I did with my father-in-law at Augusta, Maine, was a harrowing experience. It was a twin prop, but on this one, the engine's in front of the cockpit, cockpit and behind me. We came in at Augusta, and it was a hard landing. Those, and that plane was meant to take it, but it was harrowing. If you're not used to how hard, when you hit a dead spot of air, a plane can be set down. Traditional Christian thinking says that after Jesus' death on the cross, somehow the being of Jesus descended into hell, which was in that time the place of waiting, and brought salvation 
to all the righteous persons who had died since the beginning of time. Jesus descended into hell is one of the key points of all classic Christian creeds. Now, as an Anabaptist denomination, we will not say a creed because the early churches in the Thirty Years' War over religion killed each other over creeds. And we said, no, no, no creeds. Ephesians 4.9 says that beyond this, G uh, uh, that Jesus went into heaven and led a train of believers with him. As time passed, a rich Christian tradition developed further writings, along with a lot of art and stained glass, further explaining the story, asserting that Jesus has already triumphed over hell releasing all the persons who were trapped there before his coming and bringing salvation, especially ministering to Adam and Eve and all the saints, prophets, and godly persons of the Old Testament and of the intertestamental times. Jesus had not brought salvation to the world through his death up to this point. So this day, this is considered the day before Easter. There's Good Friday, there's Easter. Actually, the day before Easter is called Holy Saturday. Did you know that whole church services are held on this day, remembering what Christ did? I just want to explain some of these other traditions. As time went on then, Many of the church leaders taught and wrote about Jesus' ministry when heaven conquered hell. Many important books, not part of the Bible, were written that have influenced church thinking today. Now, a modern example is one of the classic is this church used the whole year with John Schaefer, the purpose-driven church. But hundreds of years ago, there were many other books written trying to explain some of these finer points of Christian thinking. And one of these was called The Book of Nicodemus, or The Good News of Nicodemus. And it was written about 200 AD. And here he kind of puts, creates a word picture explaining how Jesus might have descended into hell and brought salvation to the souls there who were being held prisoners by Satan. So the story is a word picture, and it begins with a dialogue between the place, Hades, and the person, Satan. <coughs> they had heard that Jesus was crucified and that Jesus was coming to hell itself. And they got into a big debate about the power of Jesus. The place Hades is getting scared and says they have heard about he because they have heard about Jesus' miracles and power. Satan is more confident and says, Oh no, Jesus could never come here because Jesus died between common criminals. Satan is certain that if Jesus tries to come, he is strong enough to bind and subdue this dead Savior if he tries to come to the netherworld. So Hades, the place, bids its servants to lock the gates of hell. And then you can see many of this great medieval art of Jesus coming, and this is these are word pictures, and shattering and knocking down the gates of Hades. Then you see Jesus grabbing Satan, binding him with chains, and consigning Satan to Hades until his second return. Then in great triumph, Jesus raises up Adam and Eve along with the prophets and the saints of the Old Testament. And all of those who died in God's righteousness 
up to that very point of Jesus' crucifixion. Then, Jesus leads them in this great parade out of hell, up and into heaven. And they're joyfully celebrating and praising God. This was circulated and read for hundreds and hundreds of years, like 1,800 years. And just as important, this story gave rise to many works of art because in the Middle Ages, most persons were non-literate, so they learned their Bible stories through all the great stained glass pictures in the church. The preacher could actually stand and say, see that? See what this means? Uh, it was a fascinating process that doesn't relate to you and I. Often by the Middle Ages, only the pastor in the local church was the person who was able to read and then the Bible was chained to the pulpit. He only had access to it. Those were very different times. Let's move forward now to today. The Greek Orthodox Church has an amazing service on Holy Saturday. My problem is their services are long. Two, three, four hours. And some of us Dutchmen are just too rushy. Uh, that's, um, uh, that's a whole other thing. It's not a put down, I'm just saying. Uh, some of us aren't used to sitting still for love or money that long. <clears throat> but the Greek Orthodox Church, by far, has the most beautiful services on this day. And sometimes, by the way, it will start at 9 o'clock on Easter Eve and go all night. And then you have the celebration Easter morning. It's just a totally different tradition. We must say that. But the Greek Orthodox Church uses one hymn that to me totally amazes me. And here's the key phrase. That, that as in the hymn they sing out. Today Hades cried out. Would that I would have not received the one born of Mary. For he came upon me and took my power. He shattered the gates of brass. The souls which I held captive from old. As God. He raised him up. And then the refrain. Glory, O Lord, to your cross and to your resurrection. Then again, today Hades cried out. My authority is dissolved. I'm powerless to contain Christ. I lost all of those whom I have ruled. For ages I was able to hold the dead. Behold, he's raising them up. And then again, glory, O Lord, to your cross and to your resurrection. Today, Hades has cried out, My power has been trampled on. Adam has been raised up. I am deprived of those over which I could rule. He who was crucified has cleared my tombs. The dominion of death is no more. And then, glory, O Lord, to your cross and to your resurrection. For that tradition, the Greek Orthodox tradition, hell is not just a fearful place of torment. For them, it is the battlefield where a great battle has already been fought and won because Christ has already <coughs> triumphed over the last enemy, which is death. So as the Orthodox service begins on Holy Saturday, and it begins at various times, the pastor, I'll call him the pastor because we don't call people father in our traditions, will walk down the center aisle throwing rose petals, flowers, and laurel leaves around the church. The laurel symbolizes the broken gates of hell. Laurel symbolizes victory. The flowers represent a parade of triumph for the believer, 
and the, and the, uh, the attendees also throw flowers to honor the victor Christ in this battle. And everything is left kind of with stuff laying around for Sunday morning. So on Sunday morning you come in, the church is disturbed. Some things are messed up and it's left like that. And so the people come in and sing, Christ the Lord is risen today, and they walk down the parade of honor that Christ led his people out of hell. And they sing to the victor over death, Jesus is Lord. Ephesians 4 8 says, Christ captured captivity. And this is also known as the first victory of the resurrection. <coughs> the Gospel of Nicodemus says, and again, these are word pictures, and this is not scripture, but it is tradition. So the Gospel of Nicodemus says, in the blackness of darkness, suddenly there appeared the color of the sun, like gold, and a purple colored light lit up all the darkness. Then the Lord stretching forth his hand, made the sign of the cross upon Adam, and then on all the saints. He took hand, uh, he took Adam by his right hand, they all ascended from hell, and all the saints of God followed him. Well, as you and I continue our journey to Easter 2022, May we remember 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55, who says, O death, where is your sting? O hell, where is your victory? Hell is a desecrated battlefield. The battle is already won. Hell is already conquered. It is our job to live, to serve, and to love in these promises. So may we sing with all of our hearts, all glory, loud, and honor to the Redeemer King. And that's number 218. <laughs>
And again, we'll read this responsibly, the congregation re reading what's printed in red. And I'm going to ask you to read with real volume and feeling as we worship God in our dismissal. And I'll begin. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where is help to come from? Help comes to me from Jehovah, who made heaven and earth. Jehovah guards you, shades you. With Jehovah at your right hand, sun cannot strike you down by day, nor moon at night. Jehovah guards you from harm. He guards your lives. He guards your leading. Coming back. 